Uh, Congressman, it's good to see you. Let me just start with this issue of, of the Justice Department and providing some teeth for your subpoenas here. Look, the timeline, you know, anything had happened in November, but the way, if you look at the time between the one they are pursuing with Bannon, between your referral and the actual trial, if they're on the same timeline for, say, Scavino and Navarro here, we may not find out until sometime next calendar year whether uh, they have to turn this stuff over. What is your hope that the Justice Department does going forward, and how fast do you think they can act? Well, I think a number of members of the committee expressed our general sense that they need to step it up if they're going to be part of the process of bringing these people to uh, criminal justice and accountability. Of course, our role as the select committee is different. We're trying to promote accountability in a much broader sense. We want to tell the complete story of what happened to the American people and to Congress and then make very specific recommendations about what we need to do to fortify democratic institutions and um, processes against future coups and insurrections against our government. What, what, let me ask you this. Why do you think the Meadows referral has not been taken up yet? I, I don't think I could say. Um, you know, we, each one of those cases um, seems to be on its own timeline. We're just hoping that the Department of Justice understands the urgency with which we are acting here. Well, in fairness, it doesn't look like they are. I mean, and how do you how do you coax them? You can't, you know, privately it would look like, you know, nobody wants to look like you guys, everybody's working in cahoots. On the other hand, there's a part of me that wonders, why is it there a, a special uh, a group of people at the Justice Department basically solely focused on this right now? Well, of course, there could be a special counsel, and the special counsel has been recommended by a number of people, including uh, Professor Tribe, to deal with this issue. But, you know, one of the things we're trying to rebuild uh, after the wreckage of the Trump administration is both congressional and presidential respect for the independence of the law enforcement function. So I, I don't think anything we say is going to uh, dictate the course of action at the DOJ. And we want to make sure that People understand they're the ones in charge there. But we've got a very big responsibility here because, um, you know, they have brought more than 700 and different, 700 different prosecutions against people for criminal mm -hmm. trespass and interference with the federal proceeding and assault on federal officers. There have even been charges of seditious conspiracy, conspiracy to overthrow the government. So they're working their way up. But our job as the select committee is to give a report to the American people through hearings and through a written and perhaps a video document mm -hmm. explaining what happened so we can make sure that the country gets together on rejecting violent insurrectionism and coups against our constitutional process for electing people and the peaceful transfer of power. Let's talk about the ruling the judge made out in California that, that maybe— uh, get you a step closer to getting John Eastman's uh, to have to turn over records that you guys have subpoenaed. Uh, this is the lawyer that essentially tried to plan this legal, that came up with this legal theory, trying to get the vice president to delay certification in some form. Um, the judge w said, based, said that it's possible the president himself committed a crime here. Uh, I know the, the committee has not ruled out the idea of a criminal referral for the former president when all is said and done. But what did you make of that judge's assessment? Well, it was an extraordinary thing, and I'm glad that people across the country are taking note that we have a United States District Court judge now who says that it was likely and more likely than not that the president engaged in a criminal effort to interfere with a federal proceeding and essentially to defraud the public of its right to an honest election. And then he went beyond that to say that it might have been the, it might have spelled the end of the peaceful transfer of power in America, undermining democracy and the Constitution uh, for forever after. And if you look at the very last sentence of uh, the decision, I think it may be the most important one, because there he orders 
uh, John Eastman to turn over directly to the committee the documents that we're looking for. And I hope that that will establish a precedent now for these judges who are rejecting all of the phony claims of executive privilege and attorney-client privilege, none of which can cover criminal activity like coups and insurrections, um, that, you know, the, these um, judges are can now not just reject these claims, mm -hmm. but actually compel these witnesses to turn over the evidence that we're looking for. Let me move to the phone log part of this story and this uh, this identification of a massive gap uh, in phone logs at the White House on January 6th. You know, given what we've seen with the former president, we found out that he took classified records, those that were turned over, he regularly would try to tear things up. They had to be taped back together because he was violating the Presidential Records Act. Uh, was this gap unique or is this a continuing pattern as you've been trying to get where there's a lot of missing records and is not just around this period? It, it, how much of this is a regular practice of the Trump White House? Well, th that's an important question. I'm not sure we know the answer to it. Um, mm -hmm. I'm very curious about these um, sudden and very long gaps in uh, the record uh, of phone calls, phone calls, guests, and so on. Um, you know, one possibility when a gap like this exists is that uh, the, the president or whomever we're looking at uh, is using a different phone. Um, and right. that could be a different office phone number than we have. It could be a burner phone, uh, for we all know. There's also the possibility that somebody is deliberately suppressing um, the release of these materials. And we just don't know. And that's something we want to look to. Um, I, I will say that it seems like uh, we've had overwhelming participation and cooperation from the witnesses we want to talk to. Right. But the closer you get to Donald Trump, there's a coterie around him and an entourage that is blocking our ability to get information and very specifically about the events that took place over the course of the afternoon of January 6th. Uh, the, pre the former president seemed to almost confirm something that he did differently. He claimed it, it, was, it was a very typical Trump statement. I'm sure you saw it and probably made you sm smirk where he said he never heard of the term burner phone. But of course, it never he never issued a denial that he might have been using a different phone. Uh, yeah, it, but one can be using a burner phone without understanding uh, that's what they're the commonly burner. called. And so, yeah, we don't know. Perhaps he was using a, a staffer's phone. We're not sure. But the point is, this shouldn't be a game of hide and go seek. It's not cat and mouse, as the Supreme Court has repeatedly emphasized mm -hmm. when it comes to congressional investigations. If Congress comes calling for information that it needs, for us yeah. to do our jobs, then you turn it over. And to me, it's just scandalous that you have anyone, much less a former president of the United States, yeah. who's encouraging people not to cooperate in an investigation into a violent insurrection, a deadly insurrection against our own government. I, I get the, one of the reasons I keep pursuing this, I, I, I wonder if you guys have stumbled on where they just have been doing this for years while they were in the White House. And, they, and the amount of you know, that, 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 that there's a more massive cover up here, perhaps, than just the narrow window, which you guys have been looking at. And, and again, you, that that's a, we're all going to find out the answer to that question. Let me move to the Jenny Thomas situation. Um, what would be why would you want to subpoena her? Well, look, let's start with this. Jenny Thomas is a private citizen who has every bit as much right as you or me or anybody else to engage in political activity. But she also is equal to everybody else and has no more right to engage in criminal insurrection or coup plotting than anybody else does. And so we are in the business of trying to figure out what happened to us on January 6th. So to the extent that she uh, entangled herself and embroiled herself in these efforts to actually overturn the presidential election result, then we would be interested in talking to her. Um, if she was not interested in that and was just expressing her political views, well, then we wouldn't be interested. So uh, I would say we should just follow where the evidence leads us. It sounds like what you're saying, if there's some evidence she was involved in some of the planning or organizing of any of the rallies, that makes her relevant if she is essentially 
uh, a very famous commenter and texter to Mark Meadows that that isn't? Is that, is that what you're looking for to see? Was there more than just her bizarre rants uh, in Mark Meadows' phone? Yeah, I think that's basically it. I mean, even organizing a rally doesn't necessarily make you someone we need to talk to. What we're interested is pe in people who have information about two streams of activity. One was the organizing mm -hmm. of a violent insurrection and an attack on the Capitol that wounded, injured, and hospitalized 150 officers. Mm -hmm. And then a separate but related and connected stream of activity to try to coerce Mike Pence into rejecting electoral college votes in order to lower Joe Biden's total from 306 to below 270, right. and then to try to kick the whole contest into the House of Representatives for a contingent election. And so both of those involved illegitimate means. And if she was involved in either or both of those um, or knows something about it, we would want to talk to her. And if, if she wasn't, if she was just, you know, saying she was disappointed right. in the election result, She's got a right to say that, obviously. So, in other words, we should treat her just like anybody else. She gets no special pass uh, because of who she's married right. to, but also she gets no special targeting because of who she's uh, married to. We're interested in what she did.